Hello and welcome along to Wired Foresight. I'm Greg Williams. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Wired. Today's session is part of an ongoing series of conversations with leading figures and innovative thinkers in business, science, technology, academia and policy. To really investigate the fast-paced changes the world is currently undergoing, to explore how the world will be shaped in the coming months and years, and most importantly, to try and understand how we can prepare for these changes. We intend that our live virtual briefings are punchy, they're top level sessions with a guest speaker on a key topic or theme. Each starts with a brief introduction from the speaker, goes into a discussion with the editor, and is followed by a Q&A session featuring your questions. We know that you're busy, we know that you want concisive, authoritative briefings, so these discussions will last roughly 25 minutes. Today, we investigate social behavior and connection in a COVID-19 world. So the requirement for social distancing and remote living these past few months has added an incredible pressure on people's mental health with increased feelings of isolation and loneliness. Today we ask, is it possible to replicate the emotionally driven shared experience of in-person interaction in a virtual world? And to discuss this, I'm delighted to welcome Herman Narula. Herman is one of the leading innovators in research into virtual worlds and simulation, and his company Improbable enables developers to make extraordinary multiplayer games and to simulate real world scenarios with incredible detail and complexity. Herman, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, thanks for having me. So I really thought it'd be a good idea to maybe begin with a little bit of context. Um, tell us a little bit, I mean, Improbable was founded in 2012, I think I'm right. Um, tell us a little bit about the, what the vision was initially when you founded the company. Sure. So, I mean, I've had a lifelong fascination, uh, as did my co-founders, with games and virtual worlds. And I think even then, and this was, you know, a billion people became gamers from when we started the company to now. The industry wow. was two and a half times bigger. So back then it was, it was a, a more of a sort of leap. But we believed then that video games had a profound outsized importance to society and the world yeah. in a way that wasn't reflected in the kinds of games people were able to make back then and also in the kind of commercial uh, success that was happening. And I think that vision has remained true. We want to be the virtual worlds company. We want to enable this new era of massive, meaningful, complex virtual worlds that can improve our lives. Sure. Uh, one, one area I'm really interested in, in getting into in this, this uh, conversation is this idea. I heard you use the word, artif uh, sorry, the phrase artificial reality in the past, which obviously sounds like a, an oxymoron to a lot of people. <laughs> Can you explain what you mean by an, an artificial reality? So I, I do think it is maybe the wrong term, but okay. essentially it's a, it's a virtual world that is important enough to you and your investment in it and the value you're getting from it that you would struggle to decide uh, whether something in that virtual world or something in the real world was of equal value. So like an interesting test you could apply would be, imagine if you owned a house in a virtual world because you enjoyed a particular game or environment. If enough people played that world yeah, and if yeah. that house had enough value to you, both socially and practically, it might actually start to be as valuable as a real world property to you. So I really define the, the, the importance of a virtual world based upon the quantity of human meaning placed in it. And so when I talk about an artificial reality, it's, it's a world so meaningful, so important to so many people that it may as well be the real world. So that, that's super interesting. I mean, if it's going to be infused with this kind of this, this deep power, this emotion, this, this meaning to people, how do you go about creating that? What's the, can you give us a sense, you know, in, in layman's terms, I guess, of how do you build a world that has that level of, of meaning and power for people? So I think the most important thing is that a world has to be of sufficient scale for people to have meaningful interactions with it. Um, you know, if you want to see the effect of a real festival like Glastonbury inside a virtual world. We're not going to achieve that with a hundred people in a single world, you know, dancing in the living rooms. It's yeah. going to be a hundred thousand people in a single environment um, with all of the interesting emergent effects of lots of human beings that really create that value. So one is scale. The other is really in terms of the, the computational power that's going into making that world come to life. Um, if you imagine more primitive video games from the last sort of 10 years, they've felt a bit like um, Disneyland rides. You know, there's not a lot of interaction you can have in the world. There, when you move around the world, there's a bubble of reality. And when you're not there, the world ceases to exist. And yeah. that can give you some great entertainment, but it doesn't really allow people to have a meaningful, consequential relationship with the world. And I think the third one, you know, for me is 
whether or not there is a real opportunity for meaningful work inside that world. Can a human being who's playing it, are they more than a player? Can they contribute? Can they engage with that world um, in ways that are, are beyond entertainment? So for instance, one of the titles that we are uh, working on privately at the moment is exploring the idea of uh, people being paid for their role inside a virtual world. So that's a very right. early but that's the kind of thing I mean when I talk about meaningful work. And with those, with that, that kind of idea of payment and that idea of work, can that, can that bleed back into the, to, to the real world? Oh, absolutely. Uh, that's absolutely. I, I look at the current COVID crisis and massive loss of service-based jobs. And I see a future where, you know, service-based jobs come back in a roaring way inside video games. Um, the economics of large-scale games tend to prioritize the monetization of a small percentage of users. So one, two percent of people in a free-to-play game are often responsible for a huge amount of the revenue. Right, which means right. there's a lot of opportunity for other people to do work that could make those people more efficiently monetized. Yeah, so a good yeah. example here is learning how to play a game, by right? getting coaching inside a game uh, with someone who's a great player who's teaching you and who you're paying. That isn't a new idea, but it's accelerating in scope very quickly. That's super interesting. And, and you're now in a position with the acquisition of it, Midway Entertainment, I think it was, like, was last year, uh, yeah. it, September, October, around then. You're producing your, your own games, but it sounds like you're not just thinking of them as, you know, stereotypical sort of games that people play and then walk away from, but that they're infused with a, with a lot more power and a lot more kind of, um, a lot more meaning and, and, and integral sort of human experience in, in some ways, in many ways. That, that's absolutely our goal. We look at all of our content and, you know, part of why we're making that content is to develop our technology better and to be better partners to the largest games companies that work with us. But our goal with it is to be more experimental and to take risk and to create content that people can have a relationship with that goes beyond a typical game. So all of the factors I just mentioned, scale, deeper interactions, sophisticated involvement and relationships are all key into what we build. But it's very hard. Um, game design as a field is really in its infancy. Um, you know, there's there's pretty much a lot of debate about what ev what it even is you're maximizing when you build a game. You know, what yeah. what do you even how do you even measure fun? What does that even look like? And I think <laughs> the questions it leads to are a lot of questions about how we engage with and become happy in the real world. You know, for a game to be really successful, it has to give you more life. It has to give you all of the things, competence, relatedness, autonomy that you enjoy in the real world. You can't really fake those things. Yeah, yeah, and I guess that 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 kind of those powerful emotional moments. Are, are, are really intriguing for me. I, mean, I, you know, I remember having a, co a conversation with um, Jaron Lanier about, about virtual reality. And one of these kind of um, comments that sort of stayed with me was he talked about the way that if people have had an experience in, in VR, they will almost see that experience as having been real because they will have created a memory around it, a very because of the emotion. I'm really interested to get your sense of how you think human beings are going to be maybe shaped by our experience of virtual world. How, how do you think our, our, our sense of ourselves and the world around us might come to be shaped? I think that we are um, already incredibly invested as people in symbolism, stories, ideas, um, you know, mo much of what we value in the world from markets to celebrity to influencers, they're not tangible things. They're, they're things that live in the life of the mind. So with that in mind, I actually think that, um, you know, games being interactive uh, will supercharge the amount of investment that we put in that area. And some of the ways that our experiences might change, we might start to value different things. Um, you know, being in a position where you've had amazing, you know, unforgettable experiences inside a virtual world with other people have been part of key events, uh, have meaningful, played a meaningful role could yeah. become a form of everyday celebrity and a form of everyday experience and value that actually changes our social cohesion a little bit. Um, you know, games, games in virtual worlds present a lot of new forms of value that people might want to partake in and to be part of. We've seen a lot of social value created over the past few years with, with social media, which has obviously now become, you know, highly charged, highly polarized um, environment. Do you see the possibility of something ha similar happening with virtual worlds and, and online games? How, how can that be managed in, in a way so that we don't have the negative, uh, you know, externalities that we've, we've had with social media? So there's, you know, we always as a species find a way to mess up whatever good new toy we get given. <laughs> but I'm 100% yeah, sure we're that we have yeah. some, some terrible thing with this new thing. But, <laughs> but as it stands, I actually see gaming as being an antidote to a lot of the problems that social media has caused. So with social media and with the attention economy, all we value is clicks and all we value is grabbing your attention. Games monetize very differently. 
games monetize primarily based on retentiveness, the long-term relationship you have with the game. That's fundamental right. to the existence of online games. So one of the things that games companies have started doing is trying to make you make more friends inside that game, trying to make you have positive experiences that keep you coming back. If we just make you furious and angry all the time, and if we, if we polarize you and make you reject that environment, you're not going to build and invest in that environment. So yeah. one good thing is that the economics of gaming fundamentally goes there. The other great thing about gaming is it's one of the few places in the world where we can agree upon facts. Um, you know, when you lose a game or win a game or when you're in an environment, when conflict occurs, when shared experiences occur, you know, we all agree on what's happening and why it's happening and where we are. So I think the potential for games to bring people close together um, by giving them shared experiences, much in the way that sport has done for many years, yeah. um, you know, I, I think could be a very powerful healing component. When you, when you press matchmake today on a, on a game like Fortnite, you're being matched with people, rich, poor, different races, different genders, different stories and backgrounds. So you might never normally meet. And that might very well lead to a friendship or lead to a, an interesting connection. I mean, there are probably people today on opposite sides of a war zone based on age demographics and, uh, and, and matchmaking cues who happen to be playing in the same game together on the same team right now. Sure, sure. But then how would you, what would you say to those people who, who, who might argue that um, occupying this virtual space, spending so much time, arguably in a solitary environment, I'm sure that you'd argue that, you know, it's not solitary because you are in a kind of communal atmosphere. But how, how, would, you, how would you make the argument that actually this isn't damaging people's sort of social skills in the real world? Well, we're here right now. We're in a virtual world. I'm talking with you. There's 300 people listening. Do we yeah. feel like we're in a social environment? I do. Do we feel like we're engaging with one another? Sure. It's not necessarily as great as um, being engaged in the real world, this particular medium. But I don't think we'd argue that this is an isolating experience. And I think yeah. for a lot of people that don't play games, they're understandably skeptical um, or understandably worried about what it could do to people. And I, and I think I would encourage people to try games more and to see that games come in all shapes and sizes. There are negative experiences and isolating ones. There are very powerful uh, learning and healing ones. I'll just you know, relay one anecdote. A, um, a close friend of mine in the industry, he talks about how he plays Minecraft with his daughter and she's 14 years old. And one of the things he says is that the conversations they have when they're playing Minecraft together are completely different from the conversations they have in the real world. That She treats him like a peer, like a friend, and she's much more comfortable with him being with her friends in Minecraft than in the real world. Um, you know, and he travels a lot, so they kind of connect kind of remotely. I mean, another friend of mine who, um, who uh, is uh, in, involved in a very big role-playing uh, games company in the United States, you yeah. know, for 10 years, he lived away from his father, and the number one way they connected is they played World of Warcraft together. And, you know, that was a really beautiful way for them to have shared experiences, despite they couldn't live together. Yeah, I, I, I can understand that. It's a bit like when people are, you know, have, have, have another kind of shared interest. Uh, maybe they're working along each other, alongside each other. What, one of the, I think, the, the crucial areas that you've introduced, which I think is, is absolutely fascinating, fascinating, is that the, the world you're creating, they're persistent which I think is, is such a, an interesting idea. Give us a sense of what kind of complexity this introduces and, uh, and the kind of the, the variables that you, you have to consider when you're, 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 you're building this kind of a world. So the most important indicator, in my view, as to the, um, as to the potential health of a game is the number of times it's been tested, the number of play tests and the amount of times it's actually been played before launch. There's a very strong correlation in the industry between games that came together early and were incrementally improved versus games that came together late and their eventual success. Unfortunately, the more you make something like the real world, the more you make it persistent, the more you have you know, the ability for you to go on a very, very long four, four five week adventure, the harder it becomes to test or even really predict what will happen. Um, you, know, you, can event, you can end up building a very imbalanced economy or ecology. And the thinking that needs to go into testing these games, weirdly enough, ends up being much closer to the kind of work we do in our government work, um, yeah. where actually it's really hard to understand whether a particular feature is going to result in a benefit or not. So no, no ability of these virtual worlds becomes harder and harder as they become more complex. I think the other factor that goes into it is content. Um, you know, to build a really long-term relationship with the world, you need a hell of a lot of content. You need enormous amounts of places, people, and things. Um, and I think that fights against the desire that the industry has traditionally had for visual fidelity. So, you know, for us as a business, we've made a conscious decision to, to build beautiful games, but not to try to um, beat everyone on, on, uh, on visual fidelity because it reduces the speed with which we can build content. And we think more content is much more important than visual quality. 
So, so I'm really interested to get a, your sense of, uh, you, you mentioned some of the other work you do. How might these kind of um, uh, simulations be applied outside of, of gaming? Like what kind of scenarios? I mean, the obvious one at the moment obviously being COVID-19. Um, can you help with the mapping of, of how it spreads or, or even uh, the search for, for a vaccine? So the same technology that builds complex simulations uh, in, for, in, a, in a gaming sense in, in, ends up being extremely useful to try to model the real world. One of the areas, and we have actually done work on the COVID side as well, I think you guys actually reported about it uh, a while ago, but one of the areas that isn't so widely known that I think is probably worth talking about is um, military training and uh, training in general. So there are very few situations in the real world where you can bring together thousands of people to do something that would normally be really expensive in the real world, like a major military exercise or, or training exercise. And why that's so important is that so much of the challenges in our world come from coordination failures or a difficulty in, in bringing together large amounts of information and people and avoiding mistakes and errors. So it seems like games are very promising for you know, everything from disaster relief, military training, large scale training as environments where we can practice things that we wouldn't normally do in the real world. I think a common misconception is that simulations like ours can tell the future, they, they can't. All they can do is allow you to explore a problem and understand the sensitivity of a model to different ways you could play with it. And that can be very powerful when you're doing urban planning, when you're deciding what interventions might be a good idea in the context of a, of, of a pandemic. But it's only one tool in the toolbox. And I think when they get overused, they're also quite harmful. But presumably, if you're able to you know, simulate various scenarios, that does give you a sense of what you know, future planning, how, how you might apply sort of, you know, you know, some kind of rules base, uh, you know, uh, in, in order to get, to get a better outcome. Exactly. Maybe a worked example would sort of help. So we, we once did a, um, an exercise that uh, focused on trying to understand uh, the infrastructural vulnerabilities of a city. So what are some of the disasters and problems that could go wrong and how do we stop them from happening? And what we found is that, you know, by playing with the model and trying lots of different things, almost like SimCity, we were able to figure out that there were certain vulnerabilities and problems that don't seem like issues when you look at most scenarios. But as you start to play with more and more and more scenarios, you see that problems come back again and again to those one or two areas. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of our modern world is overwhelmingly complex. It's just thousands of systems working, working together in different ways. Um, human beings who still make most of the decisions need ways of, of managing that complexity. And I think a model is a better way for a human being to understand something. You know, you, you, we're used to trying things, seeing what happens and trying again. And that can help you build a picture over time, over many scenarios, over what the sensitivities to something are. It's a bit like, like getting experience, like learning about the real world, um, but just in an artificial setting. Uh, that, that makes total sense. So to give us a sense, I, I think we need to go to Q&A fairly soon, but um, I'm really intrigued to get your sense of well, where is this going to go in the next few years? What, what, what are your ambitions for, for Improbable and, and how can we solve some real world problems? So, I mean, I, I, I'll say this and I'll, I might regret it in a few years, but I don't think I will. <laughs> I really think the next decade will be in, in the context of society and human experience will be almost entirely defined by games and virtual worlds. Right. Um, change tends to be in this space and social habits, it tends to build up as pressure and then a disaster or a change like COVID happens and suddenly everyone's on Zoom. You know, we all could have been doing Zoom meetings last year, but what happened is that we now have an impetus to go there. And I think a single game or a handful of games by us, by other people that start to show what virtual worlds can really do and create meaningful opportunities for income, and, you know, for people who play them, et cetera, I think will change the social conversation catastrophically and dramatically very, very quickly. Mm. So I think gaming is the big disruptor of the coming 10 years and it's not where everyone is looking. And it is where I, was about I to say that, like everyone's talking about AI being the big disruptor, but you clearly think that, that the gaming is going to be equally. Yeah, honestly, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's, it's going to be so disruptive precisely because um, so many people are not familiar with the medium. There's two and a half billion gamers. And they don't overlap very much with the people who are making the most decisions in our society or running our biggest company yeah. or making investments. So there's a bit of an age gap between people who are native to this, see it, really get it, and people who aren't. I'm reminded a little bit of um, uh, digital trading in stock exchanges, which uh, there's a fantastic book called Dark Pools about this, yeah. but you yeah. know, it was yeah. very much ignored by the folks who were mostly in charge until it became a big issue. I see gaming as doing something similar, and I look at that as the most disruptive thing. For us, um, our goal is simple. We want to be the virtual worlds company. We want to be the foundation that enables everyone else uh, to build these incredible worlds. And we look at a huge gap in a business that's reliable enough, capable enough technically to do that. It's huge heavy lifting. And we spent the last seven years building the infrastructure just so that we could uh, you know, be that business. And we're excited to see what's happening next. Great. Um, so, we, so we have uh, quite a few questions here. Um, if you don't mind just having a look at the Q&A, Herman. 
um, and maybe pick out sort of, uh, you know, a, a two or three that you think are, are, are interested that you'd like to, uh, to take on. Your Minecraft anecdote reminds me of the Simpsons episode where Marge and Bart play in the virtual realm together. So great episode of the Simpsons. Uh, the <laughs> question, uh, who's anonymous is, do you think a person's virtual version of themselves matches their real self? And if they don't, how can they make a lasting connection that can translate into real life? Mm, that's a great so, question. Um, I, I like to use an, an, an example to sort of, uh, a historical example to frame this, because I think it connects to people who are gamers and non-gamers alike. Um, if we were to take someone from this call and we were to stick them in Europe, uh, you know, just post-plague, uh, you know, much smaller population, kind of collapsed society and ask what's the difference between them and an average person who's living there? Well, there are loads. One of them is that that average person probably hasn't traveled very far from their house, um, probably only speaks one, maybe two languages, probably can't read, probably eats the same food over and over again. Now, if you look at our lives today, they're endlessly richer, right? The number of ideas we're exposed to on a daily basis. You know, the average person in an affluent country today is traveling all over the world on holiday, um, is eating things in supermarkets people couldn't have dreamt of before is being bombarded with new ideas. In the same way, I look at gaming and virtual worlds as unlocking the idea of being more than just one person, having what I would call the multiversal self, being able to be many different versions of yourself in different worlds and contexts. And in the same way that our lives are richer now than they were then, I think future generations will look at us and consider us to not have that rich a mental life, uh, you know, compared to people who have such an ocean of riches um, in the places they can explore. So I look at it as an expansion of you, um, not a containment of you. Maybe you've always wanted to try being a different um, person entirely. I think games give you that power. I kind of think this one's quite interesting. How can decision makers better use games to evaluate potential scenarios and courses of action to improve outcomes in the real world? I guess you kind of answered that uh, earlier but I think on. There's a, I think there's an important point to it too, which is what we've encountered more and more as we talk to governments and decision makers is that typically training is not something you fail. You know, tra training is something you succeed. You always succeed at training. So the, the attitude required to take advantage of virtual worlds is to want to red team yourself, to want to, to want to fail in a virtual context so that you don't fail in the real world. So even before the tools get become available and widely used, there has to be a big mindset shift about how we, how we stress test ourselves in the real world, how we try things, how we, how we test to see if we're ready. That hasn't necessarily filtered through to all organizations yet. So I think that'll become a big part of that process. Yeah. Um, there's a question on visual fidelity, which I think is a good one. Um, what effect do you believe the visual fidelity of a virtual world has upon the ability of viewers to meaningfully engage with the world? I think visual fidelity is a bit of a red herring. Um, you know, our technology also supports things like VR and as worlds become more sophisticated, it's, it's good for us in a way beyond just a simulation. But I think people are perfectly capable of investing in novels, uh, you know, relationships across distance. I think we already live in our minds. I think what we need is for the world to respond to us, to be interactable, yeah. to react to us. And a very pretty painting isn't as good as an ugly but very reactive world. So to me personally, I think visual fidelity mattered more in the old games industry where the focus was just on selling movie-like experiences. But in the new world of virtual worlds, I think it's secondary. Okay, that's super interesting actually, because uh, one would have imagined the opposite because of the fidelity being such a kind of a, uh, you know, the high production values. So I'm interested in one, one question, if you don't mind me asking you, sure. um, Herman, just, and I think it's a really interesting one, like for, for people who aren't gamers, how would you suggest that they kind of begin to experience these, these virtual worlds? I think the first step is to appreciate that there, there's probably a game or experience for you that you would find as meaningful and wonderful as the best movie you've ever seen. And part of the problem is discovery is very broken in the industry. We only right. hear a couple of big titles. We don't hear about uh, lots of things that are out there. So I, you know, I, I, I would, I don't want to plug any particular game, but I would, uh, I would find a friend or colleague who does play and take a one or two recommendations and just sit down you know, with a glass of wine or a coffee and just allow yourself to immerse in some of these experiences. And I'd start with single player games, which can show you the potential of the medium and then move more on to, on to multiplayer. Great, and maybe one more that you, that you like, uh, like the look of. Do you believe we will see more real world shared experiences moving to virtual worlds, uh, shopping, attending music gigs, the cinema? Absolutely, I think there's a humongous opportunity. Um, you know, what we most want, I believe with our with our friendships and our relationships is to advance them. And the thing that advances them are shared experiences. You know, it's great catching up with your friend on the phone, talking about the past over and over again, but you can't have new experiences unless you're together. So I think the more that virtual worlds can create an engine for us to have those shared experiences, memorable events together, the more they'll become part of people's relationships. I, I would make a prediction that some of the first dates people make on the next wave of dating apps 
will be some form of virtual connection um, because it's more efficient to see if there's chemistry before a physical one. Um, you know, I, I see that as one of the ways this might happen. But it's going to be interesting uh, how that all plays out coming forward. Um, Home, we're out of time. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been delightful speaking to you virtually, but I have to say it would be great to see you in the real world at yes. some point. Um, I hope we can do that. Uh, at a, maybe at a wide event um, and thank you to everyone who joined us if you did enjoy the session please do check out the rest of the wired foresight series we have multiple discussions one a recent one with angela saini this week uh, about the return of uh, race science economist richard davis and what we can learn from extreme uh, economic environments surgeon and vr pioneer shafi ahmed uh, trust experts Rachel Botsman, all available online at uh, wired.co.uk. Uh, we're also launching the first of our virtual conferences. We have a health tech event on September the 22nd and our annual business event, Wired Smarter, is going to be on October the 13th to 15th this year. In the meantime, thank you again, Herman. Terrific to uh, have you with us today. Um, stay safe, everyone. Thank you for joining us and see you soon.